want to welcome everyone here on behalf of the Park School of Communications and the Park Center for Independent Media. I'm the director of the center, Jeff Cohen. The, I want to give a couple quick thank yous. Um, the center, this individual has given the center such complete support since the day she became the dean of the Park School of Communications. Let's hear it for Diane Gajewski. Stand up. And there would be no center, there would be no Izzy Award. The whole independent media sector in our society would be greatly diminished if not for the Park Foundation and its president, Adelaide Park Gomer. Please stand up. And I want to thank you all for being here at the seventh annual Izzy Award celebration. The Izzy's are not the Emmys, they're not the Tonys, they're not the Grammys. We don't have gowns, we don't have tuxes, we don't have 28 separate categories. We have only one category, and that's Outstanding Achievement by Independent Journalists. This is not the Oscars either. Unlike the Oscars, you will not hear jokes about the brave whistleblower Edward Snowden being some sort of traitor. Um, whistleblowers may be feared and hated in some places and in the White House, but on this night, in this room, we cherish those insiders who go out and inform the public by talking to journalists about issues like government corruption. <laughs> These whistleblowers who have brought stories to us like government corruption, war crimes, torture, mass surveillance. And we have to remember tonight that more whistleblowers have been prosecuted for speaking to journalists under the espionage statute, under our current administration, than all other administrations in our country's history combined. <laughs> On this night, uh, we celebrate a fallen hero of independent media for the last 50 years. I'm talking about Danny Schechter, the news dissector. <laughs> Danny started as a news director back in freeform rock radio in the 1960s in Boston, where he interviewed Yoko Ono and John Lennon about gender inequality. He's gone on to produce dozens of documentaries and books. He is revered as a journalistic hero by all those who fought the South African apartheid regime, revered by people inside South Africa and across the globe. He briefly did stints at CNN and ABC, but his heart was always in independent media, which is where he did 90% of his work, and he was producing independent media up until he passed away last month at the age of 72. Uh, if you don't know about Danny Schechter, the news dissector, Google him, study him. He came here to this campus right after the U.S. invasion of Iraq, and he delivered a lecture that was titled, Weapons of Mass Deception. Are the media covering the world or covering it up? Our Izzy Award is named after the legendary independent journalist I.F. Izzy Stone, who spent decades in battle against government deception and racism and McCarthyism and war. I've judged the Izzy Awards now for seven years along with Linda Jew of San Francisco, an independent media maven, and Professor Bob McChesney of the University of Illinois. We Izzy judges can attest that 2014 was a stellar year for exceptional work by independent journalists outside of the media conglomerates, reporting that was so much deeper than mainstream media coverage on issues like corporate power and environmental degradation and police misconduct and mistreatment of immigrants and immigrants' families. But there were two journalists who just sort of rose above all these other great journalists, and they are the heart of our program 
tonight, and you're going to hear from them at length. What our two Izzy Award winners did last year is not just meticulous research and reporting, not just eye-opening, clear, explanatory writing. The most important thing about our Izzy winners is that their journalism could not be ignored. Their journalism forced mainstream media to wake up and take notice. Their journalism generated discussion and debate. It sparked activism. It sparked calls for reform. To present the award to our first winner, let's bring up an independent journalist in her own right and the associate director of the Park Center for Independent Media, Maura Stevens. We've heard the term, he's got a nose for a story, referring to the quality shared by hounds who follow a scent to chase their prey. In the case of David Sirota, like Izzy Stone before him, he often picks up on small hints and then tenaciously follows their lead. David Sirota published so many hard-hitting exposés last year, it was dizzying. And I should say he's continuing to do so this week. Alone, he's had two fantastic um, exposés of Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush. Many of his exposés, however, cover a subject that seems irrelevant or boring to those who don't realize how much is at stake. Last year, he covered extensively the $3 trillion pension system in the United States. It takes courage. And it helps to have a good organization behind you, as I think you'll talk about tonight, to do what David does. Shining a light on corruption and collusion among those in lofty offices and those in sky-high boardrooms with sky-high dividend returns. He's made some very powerful people squirm. Let's watch the succinct explanation by Amy Goodman with David on Democracy Now!, including a clip of a well-known New Jersey politician. As we turn to a Wall Street scandal that's generated little attention but impacts millions of American public workers, in recent years, cities and states have been increasingly investing worker pensions in risky hedge funds, private equity, and other so-called alternative investments. Many of the investments are being done in secret, while politically connected Wall Street firms, including Blackstone, the Carlyle Group, and Elliott Management, earn millions in investment fees from taxpayers. Well, the Denver-based journalist, David Sirota, has been closely following this story for years. Last year, he revealed Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel, who once served as President Obama's chief of staff, received more than $600,000 in campaign contributions from executives at investment firms that manage Chicago pension funds. David Sirota also revealed the head of a New Jersey board that determines how the state invests its $80 billion pension fund was in direct contact with top political and campaign fundraising aides for New Jersey Governor Chris Christie during his re-election bid. Meanwhile, some states, including Illinois, Kentucky, and Rhode Island, have faced criticism for blocking the release of information about how their pension funds are being handled. Well, David Sirota joins me here in Denver, senior writer at the International Business Times. In 2013, he authored the report, The Plot Against Pensions, that was published by the Institute for America's Future. It's great to have you with us, David, for me to be in your town. Uh, explain what this is all about. Basically, states and cities are putting more and more of their pension funds in high-fee, high-risk Wall Street investments. And the question is, that's been asked is now, why? We're talking about a third of a $3 trillion public pension system being handed over effectively to Wall Street firms. Uh, high fee, that is the key point. Big fees, these firms earn huge fees off these pension funds. And the question is why? Well, there's two, really two answers. One, public pension systems are trying to big bet their way out of their shortfalls. Uh, politicians have not properly funded pension funds. They've not made their actuarially required payments each year. And so there are these shortfalls, effectively money that is owed to workers that hasn't been paid. And so rather than have a debate 
over raising taxes, a lot of politicians have said, let's give a lot of our money to high-risk Wall Street firms under the premise that that will big bet their way out of the pension funds, big bet their way out of the budget shortfalls. Uh, the problem is, is that the returns for the pension funds have been lower than the stock market, which costs basically nothing to invest in. So then the question is, well, well why are you investing in high-fee investments that aren't generating better-than-the-market uh, returns that we can get with no fees? And I think one thing you can look at is campaign contributions. You have Wall Street firms, executives at Wall Street firms, making campaign contributions, and one of the big goodies they can get back is pension investments, uh, which kind of... Uh, go under the radar. Nobody really wa very few people really watch where these investments are going. The people who do watch are the Wall Street firms. What does Governor Chris Christie have to do with this in New Jersey? Well, his pension system is one of the biggest pension systems in the world, $80 billion. That is a huge, huge pot of money for Wall Street. Uh, and Chris Christie's uh, officials have moved an enormous amount of money into hedge funds and private equity. New Jersey is now one of the biggest investors in hedge funds uh, in the world. Uh, in New Jersey, what's happened is fees have tripled. New Jersey is now paying more than $400 million a year in fees just to manage its pension system. Uh, New Jersey has all similarly delivered below median returns. That is, below median returns for similarly sized states. So it's paying a lot more in fees and getting less back than the typical pension fund, which of course is a double whammy for taxpayers. Um, when Governor Christie was asked about your David Sirota's ongoing investigation into the New Jersey pension system, he lashed out at Sirota. The article that spurred all this conversation has been written by a guy who is a completely discredited journalist who's been fired for being inaccurate and inflammatory before. So, you know, right now, anybody who can, you know, pop up on a website calls themselves a journalist. David Sirota is not a journalist, he's a hack. It's a, it's a piece, an absolutely inaccurate piece written by a, a fired reporter. So, you know, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about that stuff. And this is not a guy with a whole heck of a lot of credibility. His track record is pretty spotty. And that's why he's been fired from previous jobs. That's what great journalists do. They poke the powerful. We know he's no hack. Please join me in welcoming David Sirota. And the Izzy plaque reads, the courageous spirit of I.F. Izzy Stone is alive and thriving in the tenacious journalism of David Sirota. Thank you. Thank you for such a nice, nice. Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah, we got to get a picture? All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for coming. Uh, and obviously, thank you to um, Jeff and Brandy and Maura and the entire Park Center. Um, God, I hadn't watched that clip in a while. It was pretty, pretty wild. Uh, I'm from outside of Philadelphia, so um, you know a lot of people watch that clip back home. I, I, I live in Denver now, so when that happened, I got a lot of people, some people nervous, some people um, you know, uh, pretty fired up about it. Uh, I kind of saw it as a, um, I mean, a lot of people ask me to engage personally with, with Governor Christie. You know, what, what do you say? And what I kept saying was is that I'm not going to comment on my feelings or lack of feelings about <laughs> Governor Christie. Um, you know, but it, it, it certainly, I think, and hope exemplifies that what the kind of thing that happens to people who actually simply ask questions and report on the information that's already out there. That, that is exemplary of the kind of, of blowback you can face. Um, before I get into a couple of thoughts about this award, um, uh, I just want to say it's also an honor to be here um, with Naomi Klein. Uh, I told her before, I, you know, there was, a, there was a comedian who I'm not a fan of, uh, a guy named uh, Dane Cook, who the, uh, I don't think he's very funny. Um, and the, the story about him is that 
I don't know if this is true or not, I think it's about him, but that he didn't like to have anybody, any other comedians open for him because they would make him look not funny. And so opening for Naomi Klein is like, it's almost not fair, like, <laughs> not that you're funny. <laughs> um, so before I say anything else, I just want to offer up some thank yous um, because I, I really think it's important to recognize that an award like this is not really, I don't see it as an award for any one person, but for a collective movement comprised of people who still really believe in the mission of accountability journalism. Um, and I'll get into a discussion of what I think accountability journalism is. You know, I, I, but I do want to thank first and foremost my, my family, my parents are here tonight, they made the drive from Philly. It's, it's, it's worth remembering that, I'm, I mean, for me, I, when I was writing this speech, you know, it, it's been a really exciting and difficult and rewarding and really stressful year. And coping with that has been kind of a burden for my, <laughs> my wife and my parents and, you know, required a, an incredible amount of patience and support because, and I'll get into a little bit of a discussion about why that is and what happens when you do this kind of reporting. Um, yeah, I've always felt that support from my parents and I, I really can't imagine being able to find the confidence to do this kind of work um, without my family. I mean, that's the ultimate privilege is to have a family like that. Uh, I also want to be on record because I think it's so important to thank my editors and colleagues, Peter Goodman, Nancy Cooper, Mark Bonner, the editorial team at International Business Times. These are people who don't ever get the byline but who truly make all of the kind of work that I do possible, and I should add 500 times better than it would be. And the same can be said of my colleagues, Matthew Cunningham Cook and Andrew Perez, who are working with me on this kind of work. I mean, it really is one of the most supportive groups of people I've ever worked with. They deal with my obsessive, neurotic, overbearing, insane personality every day. And I really do see the day that Peter Goodman called me or last year and asked me to work with him at International Business Times is a really significant moment for me. And I want to thank Pando Daly also for providing me with a platform to begin the work that I did this year and that was ultimately carried on where I am. And before I say any more, I also want to just recognize a bunch of role models um, and heroes, people whose work and counsel always offered a flicker of encouraging and inspiring light, even in the dark moments. Um, Naomi Klein is one of them, Bill Moyers, Glenn Greenwald, Jeremy Scahill, Matt Taibbi, David K. Johnston, uh, Noam Chomsky, my old journalism professor John Kupetz, Amy Goodman, Tom Gagan, Alex Gibney. I mean, these are people who, when you feel crappy, you can think about and not feel so, at least so lonely uh, when you think about them um, in this line of work. So what I want to talk a little bit about tonight is um, there was this thing on Twitter, which when you start a conversation like that, it usually means you're about to talk about something stupid, because um, Twitter is generally kind of stupid. Um, but there was this thing on Twitter a couple weeks ago where uh, a, a former Reuters reporter, Felix Salmon, he set off this big you know, Twitter storm about what advice you would give to young journalists, young people thinking about a career in journalism. And his answer was basically, don't go into journalism. I have some thoughts on that, but before I, I get to those, I think it's important to take a moment on a night like this and explore what journalism actually is, especially in an age where those definitions are being deliberately blurred by those who either don't want to muster the effort or resources to do real journalism, or those who are actually opposed ideologically or because they have a vested interest in journalism. Only when you know what it actually is can you decide whether it's an important and worthy field to spend your life or part of your life in. So there's a couple differences between the definitions and the words that are thrown around. Um, you know, there's, a, there's this word news. What is, what is news? We joke in, in our newsroom that News is something that is handed to you, that it's given to you. Um, news is a press release. News is I'm, I'm at an event uh, and I'm simply going to record what's happening at this event. 
uh, without much critical thinking or critical reporting. And by critical, it doesn't mean you have to be against it. It just means analytically able to add context to it. News is not journalism unto itself. News, a press release that you rewrite, an official event that you attend and recount, a speech that you transcribe, that's news. It's not necessarily journalism. Journalism is the act of taking those opportunities and using them as a platform to explore something bigger and to question the fundamental assumptions that are being disseminated from that piece of news. Even better, it's the act of looking where the spotlight is not. That's actually the hardest and arguably the most important kind of journalism, where, you, where the journalism that's not happening at the press conference or from the press release. There's also a difference between aggregation and curation and journalism. It's not to say that journalism doesn't build on journalism, it does. But journalism is not simply putting two pieces of journalism together and calling it journalism. And there are a lot of business models out there right now that are trying to pass off taking other people's work and putting them together, or even just copying other people's work, and calling that journalism. It's, prom it's promotion, it's content, it may be media, but it's not journalism unto itself. And again, I want to be clear, that doesn't mean that journalism doesn't build on journalism. But taking two articles and putting them together and calling that journalism, that's, that's not journalism, and we shouldn't be fooled by what that, what that is. I think that, I should also add that there's this, there's this new phrase that's being thrown around, explanatory journalism. Have you, you heard this phrase? Um, that kind of bothers me in the sense that if you're not explaining something, you're not doing journalism. So I don't really understand what, I mean, it's kind of, uh, it's a redundancy. Uh, explanatory journalism, I think, is being used as a term designed in the media world to basically not do journalism and pretend that you are doing journalism by simply explaining somebody else's work as if readers can't understand other people's work. It's, it's actually quite a condescending construction. I think that another point that's important is that journalism, and we talked a little bit about this in the, in, in, in the Q&A before, journalism is not just about deep throat exclusive sources. It's often about what's hidden in plain sight, as Izzy Stone so often proved. That I think there's a perception out there that the only really good, necessary, hard-hitting, important journalism is the kind that flows to you from somebody like Edward Snowden. Which, by the way, the context of that story is that, is that information didn't just flow to Glenn and Laura from Edward Snowden randomly. It flowed to them because they had been doing it real journalism. And I think that we kid ourselves to think that, yeah, it's just worthy of applause. And I think we, we kid ourselves to believe that journalism is just waiting for somebody on the inside to come to you with information. That most of it actually is looking at, again, what's hidden in plain sight. What's right there that nobody's, nobody's looking at at all. That's three quarters of, that's actually probably 90% of my work. And I think that it's, there's a, I think, di disappointing and depressing paradigm in the, in the world of media that says, well, if it's public, then it's not exclusive, and then, then that means it's not news. If it's public, it's not exclusive, it's not news, because everyone already knows it. And I would say that as young people think about journalism, that, that's not the right way to think about it. The right way to think about it is what does the reader not know that the reader needs to know? And I can promise you that the reader didn't know about those pension documents that Chris Christie was so pissed off about that we reported on, even though it was right there on the New Jersey website. <laughs> I, I would also say that it's important for when young people are thinking about whether to go into journalism to understand that the seeming glory of journalism is oftentimes coupled with truly unglorious levels of stress and angst and 
um, unpleasant things. Uh, I spent a large amount of this year, probably unnecessarily so, but that's just the way I am, but uh, worrying about what was going to happen. Did we get the story right? Uh, what's going to happen if we don't get the story right? And I had this conversation with my editor, Peter Goodman, and he said, it's funny, I called him up late one night and I said, oh, you know, I just can't, I can't sleep, I just, I don't know if, you know, if the story, this or that, and he's like, and he basically said, you know, as a, as a friend, I want to tell you not to worry. But as your editor, I want to tell you to worry. Because I want you staying up at night wondering whether you got that half sentence phrased exactly right so that it's 100% accurate. So there's a tension. It's, it's almost, it's, it's, you can't avoid that if you really want to do this kind of work and you really want to do it well. Because I can tell you that Every story that we put out there, we try to make sure that every single word is phrased accurately and can be defended. And it needs to be that way because if it's not structured properly, worse things will happen to you, potentially, than just being called a hack by a politician. You can face lawsuits. You can face all sorts of threats. You can face all sorts of dangers. And by the way, you can face those threats and dangers whether you get the story right or wrong, but at least if your story is right, you have more, you're in a better position of defense. Journalism is also not just about hitting home runs all the time. It's good to want to break the big story. You should want to break the big story. But you cannot have a life in this work if you're trying to hit a home run every single time. Uh, the metaphor that I've used, it's a, it's a baseball metaphor, it's that if you step up to the plate and swing for a home run every time, you're going to be probably like most of the people who do that in the major leagues, you're going you're gonna to strike out a huge amount. And so there's a, it's important to remember that the base hits, if they're solid base hits, again to continue a bad metaphor, those are important too, and that you will not survive long in this field if you're always trying to hit a home run because it's just not it's just not possible and I may be just you may be hearing me just going through my own therapy right now telling myself that <laughs> but it's worth hearing it from somebody else you may be just actually hearing my wife telling me this uh, and I you know I have this I have this story that um, that I was reminded by this you know how did I get into this line of work we Earlier this year, we, we had a, um, a story about uh, a hedge fund billionaire who was um, essentially, I would call it stealthily funding the public broadcasting system, funding their pension-related programming, a guy who was f also financing a campaign to cut workers' pensions. And we reported out the story, and PBS ultimately gave the money back. And it was, I mean, I... I tell you this story not to tell you how, how fun a story that was to report and how exciting it was to report, but to tell you the aftermath of it, which is that when that happened, I was so blown away that something actually happened. Because we're so used to being in a world where nothing happens, or it feels like nothing is happening. And after that story happened, I was like, I, was, I, I had this huge high, and then I was like depressed. Because I was like, how am I ever going to top this again? It's not, it's just, it, was, it, was almost, it was like this massive shot of dopamine in my brain that I was like, I'm never going to be able to top this again. And I have to tell you, it took me a while to get to the right psychology of, I don't have to do that every time. I can try to do that as much as I can, but I don't have to try to do that every time. And if you try to do that every time, you're going to burn out. Or at least you're going to have gray hair. Um, there's also, as, as people think about what is journalism, what's not journalism, there's a difference between forging a career in media and forging a career in journalism. Those two are not necessarily the same. You can turn on cable news, news and know that. There are plenty of careers to be had, I should add, in media. Plenty of careers. Media is a growing industry. 
And there are plentiful jobs for those who are willing to echo the wishes of those in power. There are, at least for now, comparatively fewer careers in journalism. And so I think as young people think about this line of work, it's worth understanding that, that the media world is often hostile to journalism. Or maybe phrased a different way, the media world is not a world that revolves around journalism and certainly can be hostile to journalism. And, and this is especially true when it comes to independent journalism. Because independent journalism, I think by definition, at least implied if not explicitly, is about accountability, questioning assumptions, questioning power. And not questioning power just for the sake of it, but questioning power with the understanding that when you question power, if power, that that's a, that's a small d democratic process. That if power has a good answer and a convincing answer, then maybe that answer is a worthy one. But without the question, it can't be tested. I recently met with my friend Glenn Greenwald as he was passing through Denver. It was last week. And we talked about the difference of, of challenging power and actually doing it. And I actually asked him, I haven't seen him in a while, and I asked him a question, I, and I hope I'm not, I'm not betraying anything, but I said, listen, were you ever, like, stressed out, worried, <laughs> scared? And without telling you exactly what he said, he made the point that, and I think it's right, that there are a lot of people who talk about the need for challenging power and who cheer it on, and that support is certainly helpful. But what's less discussed is that doing it can be scary and dangerous, and it's an occupational hazard. And one of the occupational hazards of independent journalism is what was exemplified, for instance, by Chris Christie in that clip. You will be subjected to an attempt to marginalize you, marginalize your credibility, which, of course, if you're a journalist, is, a, is an attack on your employability. That's the one thing you have as a journalist, as opposed to a, just a media content provider. A journalist, the most guarded thing that you have is your credibility. That's it. That's, like, that's the most valuable thing that you have. When you strip away all of it, that's what you have. And that, the people who you will be questioning know that. That's what that clip is all about. That clip is all about saying to other journalists, really wasn't about me, it was saying to other people in the press corps, in that press corps, that if you follow that line of reporting, this is the abuse you will be subjected to, and so don't ask those questions. And my rule of thumb is basically this, when you're doing independent journalism, especially when you're doing it at an outlet that allows you to do it, which tends to not be legacy media outlets by definition. You have to do it three times as well and expect to get one-third as much attention. Really challenging power requires making fewer mistakes than those with bigger platforms because you will be marginalized by powerful people who will seize on any mistake to try to marginalize you. I mean, I'll be honest, I find myself sometimes frustrated with this reality, it, it really does seem unfair that so much of what determines if a story has resonance is about where the story comes from, not necessarily what's in the story. But there's some good news in this. I was talking to Jeff about this this afternoon. The digital age lowers the threshold for, for impact in a really revolutionary way. We may not all have the built-in platform of a New York Times or a Washington Post, but every story that you do publish has on its own now a much better chance than it ever did to find its own audience because of the internet. It's just, there's, it's a frictionless. You don't, you know, back before the internet, you may have had to, I don't know, mail everybody your story, like by the actual mail, which is hard, if not impossible. Now somebody can punch it up on their screen instantaneously. And I think that sooner rather than later, there's going to be a tipping point where the size of an audience and therefore the influence that journalism has and the virality of that 
story and the traction of a story is at least more closely related to the merits and significance of the story and the facts in the story rather than the brand influence of legacy media. I think that's going to happen. I think it is happening. And what's so exciting about this is the fact that there's a chance for a different paradigm in media where new legacy outlets can be built on a different premise. The old he said, she said, power worshiping paradigm, don't ask questions, move along, move along model can be replaced with outlets whose business models can be built on something different. And I'm really encouraged by the trends. I mean, we see it in our own traffic at International Business Times that when we do a story that's worthy and good and important, more and more those stories find an audience, an influence, and not just influence for its own sake, but influence for the kinds of changes that I think, or the kinds of at least debates that this society needs to be having. Some see for, I mean, there's other trends that seem negative but are actually positive. I mean, I see the decline in the cable news audience as not something to lament. I think it's a good thing for what it suggests. I mean, I think it really... I mean, it, it, really, it really does say something good. It says that people... I don't think it says people don't care about politics or issues or important. They're just like, I don't want three of the same blabbering faces talking to me saying nothing for, two, for an hour every night, right? I, I, don't, I, I see what's going on, and I think that's really encouraging. So should young people go into journalism, that question that created that little Twitter storm? I think the answer is yes. The world needs young people to pursue journalism and not merely just careers in media. We need young people to go in to journalism with their eyes open about the perils of doing that and about how to protect themselves. I mean, I, my editor, his biggest complaint about my writing is I take as one of the biggest compliments. My editor is always saying to me, you have to remember, this is not a legal brief, this is an article. And in my mind, what I think is, you know what, I'd rather it be that way, where I submit a legal brief that's really, really, really airtight, and then we can sculpt the narrative from it. Because protecting yourself is one of the biggest parts of this job. And if you don't protect yourself, nobody else will. I'm really confident, though, that it doesn't have to be such a risky, out on the limb experience and enterprise, that there are inherent risks. And the risks that I've faced are tiny compared to those like Jeremy Scahill or Glenn, people who do war reporting, people who are you know, on the front lines questioning the national security state. But there are risks everywhere in this, in this endeavor. And I'm convinced that it's going to become slowly but surely, not with no risk, but certainly less risky as new media models allow journalism to find a sustainable, independent audience. The only barrier is a willingness, in my estimation, to put in the time, the work, and the diligence. And I should say, there's, there's definitely easier paths. This is, this is not a path of least resistance. This is a path of, in the media world, this is the path of the most resistance. This is, every incentive says not to do this kind of work. In every financial incentive, every employment incentive says this is not really what the media world wants. But there's a tension between what the media world and the current media industry and the current media business model wants, and clearly what the audience, the public, citizens, and the world wants. That is, I think, the lesson from the work that I've done this year is not it was good or bad work. It's that when we did substantive work, it actually generated not just 
politicians yelling at me, but that it actually found an audience. And it actually, it actually informed. And it actually activated people. And I want to be clear, my job as a journalist is not to tell people how to activate themselves, not to tell them what kinds of politics to assume when they are informed and activated. My job is to simply inform. And I've heard a phrase uh, saying, I can't remember who said it, uh, but it's been said to me this sentiment a couple of times before, which is that you have to trust that an informed population will make the right decisions for itself and that the right decisions can't simply be imposed on people. That if people have enough information, the, the people, capital the people, will come ultimately to the right decision. It's not to say that I believe that advocacy is wrong. I, I, I came out of the political world. But it is to say that we face, I think, first and foremost right now in this world, a fundamental lack of, uh, of in, not just, not information, but of informed populate, populations. That I think on an issue like a $3 trillion pension system, you can't get people activated to do anything about what's going on in our entire retirement system if they don't know what's actually even happening. So a huge amount of this work is to simply inform with the, and granted some may call it religious faith, but with the confidence that a huge portion of the battle to a better society is to provide people with information that, and then trust or have faith in or have belief in that in a democratic, small d democratic society, an informed population will make the right decision. If you do not believe in that, then this is the wrong work for you. And, you know, I'm, I wouldn't necessarily call myself a completely, um, in my daily life, a totally optimistic person. <laughs> but I think to do this work at your core, you have to be optimistic. You have to believe that doing this kind of thing actually is important and will make a difference because you are optimistic that if people have the right information, the real information, the actual information, the actual context for what's going on, the right decisions will be made. So for all the young people in this room, please, don't go into media. Go into journalism. Thank you. Before we, uh, before we proceed, um, I want to give one more thank you. I don't think these events would happen without our associate, a co-worker at the Park Center for Independent Media and all the Ithaca College journalism students know her well. A thank you to Brandy Hawley. Stand up. Stand up. Our next Izzy winner is a Puffin Foundation writing fellow at the Nation Institute. She's a board member of 350.org, the grassroots movement confronting the climate crisis. She doesn't just write powerful books and columns, she writes powerful books and columns that inform and build social movements. Her first book, was called No Logo, Taking Aim at the Brand Bullies, about the misdeeds of multinational corporations, and the New York Times got this one right. They accurately referred to it as a, quote, movement Bible, unquote. She was our guest on campus in 2010, speaking about her next book, The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism. <laughs> a book that is assigned readings in several Ithaca College classes. 
She earned this year's Izzy in large measure because of her latest book, This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. She's coming off of a book tour of Europe. Her argument that confronting capitalism is essential to saving the planet as well as simultaneously solving so many other social ills, that argument is being discussed across the globe. She famously, <laughs> she famously debated one of the most belligerent of US television hosts. And shortly after that debate, this very arrogant host meekly gave up his show. I'm speaking, of course, about Stephen Colbert. I should never let Jeff do that. Um, all right, I'm timing myself. Thank you, Jeff, for those very kind words and for your decades of groundbreaking and inspiring work. As a young uh, college student, um, I would read FAIR faithfully, and it's a big part of what inspired me to get into this crazy line of work. I also want to thank the Park Center for Independent Media, the whole crew, uh, Mara and, and Brandy, and also the other two judges um, who uh, have given me this award. A huge congratulations to David Sirota for his richly uh, deserved honor this evening. It's a pleasure and a delight to be here with you. So since I'm being honored mainly for uh, This Changes Everything, uh, I have to stress that this uh, uh, really goes to a remarkable team of people who contributed uh, uh, in so many ways to the final work. Uh, my acknowledgments in the book itself uh, run at six pages, um, very small type. They actually bumped down the type for the acknowledgments uh, to make it fit. So I won't bore you with the details, but if you do read the book, please read those acknowledgments and know that research heavy books that take a half decade to write are indeed a team effort. And I am blessed to work with some really incredible researchers and editors. And in particular, I want to acknowledge my lead researcher, Rajiv Sakura, um, who uh, there are some incredible scientists in this room who have been badgered by Rajiv um, uh, because he is so um, faithful to the facts. And, and uh, I am just so incredibly grateful to be working with him and continue to work with him since the book has come out. Ali Tempest, uh, another fantastic researcher, former nation intern, uh, spent years uh, working on the book. Then we brought in other researchers for individual chapters um, and then, then other people to fact check the research. And then three lawyers lawyered it. <laughs> um, as David was saying, getting the facts right is important. Um, I've also had the great fortune to have been edited by a real a titan of the publishing world, a woman named Louise Dennis. Um, she's known uh, very well in Canada, not here in the US, but she's been editing me since No Logo and has applied her fierce intelligence to uh, my arguments um, for many years and in uncountable ways. Uh, my American editor on this book is Robert Bender. Uh, and he also pushed me hard to make a radical argument that might just be accepted uh, in a profoundly conservative political culture in this country. Um, and I'm very grateful for his contributions. I, I, we were also supported in lots of ways by The Nation magazine, where you know I always sort of work out my ideas in The Nation um, for the shock doctrine. It began uh, with an article called The Rise of Disaster Capitalism and, uh, and then Baghdad Year Zero in Harper's Magazine. Uh, in, uh, for this book, uh, I wrote several columns for 
for the nation uh, leading up to sort of just working out the ideas and, and then wrote a, a long cover story, Capitalism Versus the Climate, where the thesis of the book uh, came out a, a couple of years before, before the book. And the magazine and the Nation Institute also supported uh, my researchers who live in New York, gave them office space and um, allowed us to, to put together this sort of um, ad hoc little research institute uh, to do this project. And as always, my biggest debt is to my husband, Avi Lewis, who wishes he could be here, but is home editing a documentary film that's going to be coming out in a few months uh, that is also called This Changes Everything, um, and is focused on the movements that are on the front lines of building uh, uh, the next economy and resisting the uh, resisting the one that is at war with life on Earth and is going to bring this book's argument to a whole new and, emo uh, and more emotional level. So this award uh, has gone to some pretty amazing people over the years, and some of them uh, are real personal heroes of mine and, and, and dear friends. I can't help but feel that many of these recipients, like Jeremy Scahill and Glenn Greenwald and Amy Goodman, do a far better job of embodying IF Stone's commitment to dogged muckraking reporting than I do, seeing as I've been kind of out of the, the daily news business for, for a while writing books. But that said, I doubt you have ever given this award to anyone whose grandparents would have been more thrilled than mine. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> now, my, my grandparents both passed away, but if you'll indulge me a little bit since I'm among friends, I want to tell you a little bit about them. Um, my grandfather, Philip Klein, uh, was an artist and a socialist. And uh, when he was a young man, he got a kind of a dream job working for Walt Disney. His brother, Izzy, different Izzy, um, was already working at Disney. They were really a family of artists. And, um, and, and my grandfather worked on many of the classics, Fantasia, Bambi, Dumbo. Um, his job, um, he was officially in charge of Donald Duck continuity. So <laughs> his job was to make sure that all the Donald Ducks looked like Donald Duck. Like, don't draw. And, um, you know, he would thrill me as, as a child by, you know, just drawing Donald Duck with just about, you know, four pen strokes. Um, and, you know, when I wrote No Logo, I, I, I dedicated that book to him um, for teaching me to always look for the dirt behind the shine because my grandfather um, was fired from Walt Disney for organizing the first animators' strike in the 1940s. <laughs> um, so they were getting paid really lousy work, one of my uh, really lousy pay. Um, and uh, my, my father was, was three years old when, when they were on the picket line. Um, and, he, and, uh, and after he was fired, uh, the whole family moved back east, and, uh, and, and my grandfather earned money, you know, however he could, building ships, painting signs. Uh, he did eventually get some work as an animator again, but he had to work under a pseudonym um, during the McCarthy years uh, because of his past history. Um, he and his wife, Annie, uh, built a house in the woods in New Jersey with the help of their kids. And it was this sort of magical place. It was uh, down the road from this kind of commune called Nature Friends that was built by fellow travelers, people who wanted to get out of the city, get in touch with nature. Um, and I used to just love visiting this house. It had this great boulder in the basement because um, they had to build the house around the boulder. So we would go visit the, the boulder. Um, and the garden was filled with my grandfather's sculptures. He, you know, after he left Disney, he had more time for his own art, and he had a studio in the basement. And, um, and the inside of the house was filled with my grandmother's crafts, and the outside was her garden. And she was one of these people who always had to be doing something with her hands. And she was a big knitter and weaver. And um, when she died about 12 years ago, I wrote her obituary, and I said she was really the original hippie before there were hippies. Um, so her hands were always busy, and, um, and, and 
but yet she was incredibly intellectually curious and politically engaged. Um, so as she was doing these things with her hands, she wanted to hear things, and Audible didn't exist at this time. So she had my grandfather. And every evening um, in their little house in the woods, every evening that they weren't out folk dancing, which was their other thing, um, uh, it played out the same way. My, my grandmother would be doing something with her hands, um, making, some, making something, and my grandfather would be reading to her. Um, my memory was The New Yorker. He would read her The New Yorker cover to cover. And Izzy actually, the, my, my father's brother, Izzy, grandfather's brother, Izzy, was, was, was a cartoonist um, uh, at The New Yorker, and, and my grandfather had placed some cartoons in The New Yorker as well. Um, and, you know, they read novels too, um, but what they never missed uh, was I.F. Stone's Weekly. Whenever it came in, it was required reading, in my father's words. Um, my grandfather would read it to my grandmother every week, um, and when the kids were old enough to understand it, and knowing my grandparents, that was probably eight, um, in their judgment, um, they would read it to the kids as well. Story time. <laughs> Uh, and, um, you know, I think they really identified with, with, with I.F. Stone because, you know, he was named Izzy, <laughs> and, um, you know, he was from New Jersey, grew up in New Jersey, he was a target of McCarthyism, and um, he was an idealist who nonetheless knew exactly who his enemies were. I emailed my dad yesterday, um, like, I've, I've, you know, I've received some honors over the years, but my dad was so excited about this. And I asked him if he had any other memories of, of I.F. Stone. And, um, and he, he, you know, he reminded me that though he, my, my father went on to, to study medicine and become a medical researcher uh, in, in women's uh, maternal health. Um, but before that, he studied political science at Oberlin. And he shared this memory with me. He said, I had many papers to write, and I used to use I.F. Stone's weekly as a source when indicated. This would drive one of my right-wing professors, who was a Hungarian refugee, crazy. He regularly marked me down whenever I used I.F. Stone as a reference, but I kept doing it. Several papers that I wrote about the Korean War, around which I.F. Stone was a singular resource, got me in particular trouble. I still have the papers together with all the red marks <laughs> from the prof. Now, I'm quite sure that reading Stone on the Korean War informed my father's decision uh, a few years later to become a conscientious objector and refuse to serve in Vietnam, moving with my, <clears throat> moving with my mother uh, to Canada after a shotgun wedding. So I guess maybe I can partly thank Izzy Stone for the fact that I'm a Canadian. <laughs> um, so because I, I've made this a family affair, I want to I wanna talk about journalism and independent journalism. But you know, I realize that in truth, a, a lot of what I you know, learned, I learned from, from my parents. And um, when I was in university, I got into a lot of trouble for an article that I wrote about Israel. Um, and uh, it caused a huge controversy on campus. And it was my first, uh, it was my first taste of true controversy. The copies of the newspaper were gathered up, and thrown in the garbage. And, um, and my father called me up and he said, Naomi, it's fine to go out on a limb, but don't saw it off. Um, now his view was that I had sawed it off. I continue to believe that I did not saw off that limb, but that, that, that statement has really stayed with me. <laughs> and I think, you know, it echoes a lot of what David was talking about. You know, if you're just confirming people's beliefs, um, if you are flattering the powerful, you can be as lazy and, slop as, and as sloppy as you like. <laughs> but if you are going to be going after the powerful and if you're going to be making radical arguments that challenge entrenched power, you actually have to be really conservative <laughs> with, your, with your sources you, and, and with your relationship with facts. Um, you can't play fast and loose. You have to prove and reprove, source and resource, fact check and fact check again, um, and do your best to be bulletproof, though nobody is ever bulletproof. But that's why my endnotes run 70 pages. Um, I don't expect anyone to read them necessarily, but I also don't expect or want anybody to take me at my word. 
Now, taking facts seriously, and I, and I take facts very seriously, I don't think is the same as this idea of objectivity, this credo of the news business. And this is something that I learned from my mother. Um, my mom uh, was a documentary filmmaker, and um, she was part of this, uh, this, uh, uh, this really remarkable um, uh, institution in Canada called Studio D, which is the first women's uh, film studio, uh, I think, in the world, actually. And this was created by our national film board. Um, and uh, it came out of, a, of somebody pointing out that all of the directors were men. Um, so they actually hired film directors to make films about women's issues. Um, and, uh, and this was very controversial with all of the arguments. Why does there need to be a special, special you know, uh, studio just for women? And the male filmmakers were furious and so on. Studio D was um, headed by this uh, wonderful woman named Kathleen Shannon. And uh, she would go into meetings with the almost all male bureaucracy to fight for their little piece of the funding pie. And Kathleen would knit through these meetings and drive, that drove them crazy for some reason. She would knit. Um, and she had this uh, saying that, uh, that, that, that was like the mantra of Studio D. And this is something that my mom said to me when I st st started getting involved in campus journalism. She would quote, quote Kathleen who, um, and, and, that, and, and what Kathleen used to say was, objectivity means I object to your activity. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the Studio D, you know, I feel incredibly privileged to have grown up among this group of women filmmakers who were really breaking ground, making films um, on, uh, on everything from nuclear war, like, if, I don't know if you remember If You Love This Planet, which won an Academy Award, that came out of Studio D. Terry Nash was the director, one of my mom's best friends. I mean, I grew up with this stuff. My mom made a film about pornography that was incredibly controversial, you know, who, you know, who made films about pornography in, 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 in 1980. Um, and, uh, and the, the, this group of women saw their work of documentary filmmaking as being very much a part of the women's movement. Um, they didn't want to separate themselves from it. Uh, they were a part of it. They were a wing of it. That doesn't mean they were propagandists. It doesn't mean they were bending the truth. But they understood that media making and culture is part of any movement for transformation. Um, and some of my earliest memories are of these screenings that would happen in living rooms and, you know, church basements and where people would watch films and then cry <laughs> and then talk about it and process their feelings. <laughs> and this was what film, you know, this, is, this seemed to be what journalism was. It was about um, getting facts out there, stories that people didn't know, introducing people to new ideas that upended their worldview, and then starting conversations that weren't happening. And it was often really painful, but you stuck around, um, and, 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 and you built a movement around it, um, or you continued a movement with it. Um, and to me, this was the most natural thing in the world, and it was only after I um, kind of left university and got my first real job in journalism at Canada's national newspaper that I found out that other people didn't see it that way. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, and, I, and I, I think that this is really what is hardest for our culture to tolerate. Um, it's not the muckraking per se, um, it's not just the digging, it's the combination of the digging and the caring, I think, <laughs> that is really explosive. It's that passion and seeing the work as part of a project for social change and transformation. Um, so we've talked a lot about the importance of independent journalism, of independent media, and um, you know, I, the truth is, is that the reason we become independent is because we don't have institutions that allow us to care. Um, but we, I, I don't actually think we should have to make those choices. I think we should have institutions that appreciate that. And, and I've seen examples of that. Um, being independent isn't the point. The point is what we do with that independence. 
Um, and I think you have some very powerful examples of engaged media making, engaged authorship, and engaged scholarship uh, right here in this community. And my work would not be possible without the social movements that I write about, that inspire me, that make me think that it is worth spending five years writing a book uh, because there are movements that are there to receive it and act on it and take it to the next level. Um, I mean, I wouldn't be able to, to write if, if it weren't for that. And in fact, when I was working on this book, it w I, w I really had a lot of trouble for the first uh, three years that I, w that I was doing the work because there was the climate movement was really weak. Um, and I just, you know, I'd say to the, I have this one friend who I talk about this with, I said, I just don't know who's, I just don't see a context for this book. <laughs> and then things started to change. And then this movement started to grow. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, in, in, the, the, in the book I call it Blockadia, which is uh, a, um, a word that came out of the fight against the Keystone XL pipeline. Uh, the, the, that's what the, the, the people there who blocked the southern leg of the Keystone XL pipeline called their camp. They called it Blockadia. And now, you know, everywhere I go, there's like signs saying, welcome to Blockadia. And I feel that I'm really, really in Blockadia right now. Um, I want to read you uh, the little cameo that Ithaca makes in This Changes Everything, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, it's, 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 a ch it's in a chapter on the rise of this transnational space called Blockadia and about how the fact that we are in the midst of this crazy fossil fuel frenzy at the very moment when we should be um, weaning ourselves off fossil fuels, we are doubling down, we're digging up the dirtiest stuff in the Alberta tar sands, um, the highest emitting gas through fracking, and we know that because of the incredible researchers, um, some of whom uh, are here in this room tonight and all we'll be talking about. Um, and, uh, but, but as part of this mad frenzy, this mad ambition, the oil and gas industry has gone into some deeply hostile territory where they have looked up and gone, we're not in Texas anymore. Um, so, you know, the <laughs> Hey, and by the way, Blockadia, that was born in Texas, just to give them their due. Um, so this is the Ithaca section. One of the natural gas industry's biggest strategic mistakes was deciding it wanted to frack in and around Ithaca, New York. <laughs> a liberal college town with a vibrant economic localization movement and blessed with breathtaking gorges and waterfalls. Faced with a direct threat to its idyllic community, Ithaca began, became not just a hub for anti-fracking activism, but a center for serious academic research into the unexplored risks. It's unlikely no coincidence that researchers at Cornell University, based in Ithaca, produced the game-changing study on methane emissions link linked to fracking, whose findings became an indispensable tool for the global resistance movement. And it was the industry's great misfortune that famed biologist and author Sandra Steingraber, a world-renowned expert, let's give a hand to Sandra. <laughs> A world-renowned expert on the link between industrial toxins and cancer had recently taken up a post at Ithaca College. Steingraber threw herself into the fracking fight, providing expert testimony before countless audiences and helping to mobilize tens of thousands of New Yorkers. This work contributed to not just keeping the frackers out of Ithaca, but to a total of nearly 180 fracking bans or moratoria adopted by cities and towns across the state. Um, and of course, after the book came out, this is out of date um, because uh, that work, and of course it's not just the people that I mentioned, um, it is the work of a, of a collective movement of, un, of, of you know, uncounted thousands and thousands of people that led to the fracking ban in New York State, which you know, in my view is um, the most significant environmental victory in the United States in decades. Uh, 
Um, so obviously I was talking about Robert Horth, uh, Howarth and, and Anthony Agrafia. I know uh, Robert is here. Let's give him a round of applause. Uh, Anthony. Anthony was here. I don't know if he's still here. Oh, he, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, Anthony. Um, and, you know, another example of, uh, it, you know, and I think one of the best examples of the power of engaged media making um, is the impact of Josh Fox's film, Gaslight. Um, you know, it's, it's the film and then it's putting the film at the service of movements. And, you know, I've heard again and again about what an unbelievable organizing tool Gasland was, right? Um, it's what gets, you know, I, I often joke that, you know, in some ways we're just the excuse for people to get in a room together and talk because we don't really know how to do that anymore in our culture. We desperately need to get together and talk, but there needs to be an excuse like an award ceremony or, you know, <laughs> a, le an, a lecture from out of town or a documentary film and that just gives us you know the, the the little bit of distance that we need to say okay let's talk um, but what you need are organizers like New Yorkers Against Fracking to say we're staying and we're talking and then we're gonna act um, I, I, I one quote in the book I have is from a great or organizer a guy named Maxine Combs who's a He's a French economist. He works with a group called Attack in France, who's at the forefront of the anti-fracking movement in France. And, um, and I quote Ma Maxime saying, the scene in the film where landowner Mike Markham ignites gas from a water faucet in his home with a cigarette lighter due to natural gas exploration in the area has had a far greater impact against fracking than any report or speech. And France banned fracking. Um, so is Wales, so is Scotland in the past few months. I mean, this movement is on a roll because this is contagious. And now, you know, a lot of uh, places after winning uh, something like a statewide fracking ban would be resting uh, on their laurels. But we now see the Seneca Lake defenders. All eyes are on them and their courage. Um, And that's, you know, it's an inc incredibly important precedent um, because it's, it's, it's showing that we have to resist this uh, at every level, not just extraction, but transportation and storage. And if you happen to live in a place where you have the capacity to organize, like this place, um, then there's a responsibility to do it and people are rising to that challenge in such an amazing way. And now we're seeing the courts responding and dropping charges uh, against a lot of the people who engaged in civil disobedience because they're recognizing <laughs> Now this also is a very important precedent and this also is going to help spread uh, the, the courage um, that is going to allow more people to take actions in line with their beliefs, to act as if this is the genuine emergency that it is and people are longing to do that. Another example um, of that powerful combination of facts, research and movements is the divestment movement and the fossil fuel divestment movement. And um, you have some incredible leadership here as well. I want to acknowledge Adelaide Park Gomer, who, you know, in, in the book, I talk about the fact that the Park Foundation and Wallace Global really led the way for, in the foundation world, to say, hey, we're funding all of these green groups, and yet we're investing in fossil fuels. This doesn't make sense. They self-organized their sector, and uh, Park Foundation led the way on that, and now we have... Um, uh, Now we're really starting to see uh, this take off. The Guardian just let, has been leading a campaign calling on the Gates Foundation to divest from fossil fuels, the largest foundation in the world. Um, and, uh, and, and now Syracuse has just divested, so more <laughs> local leadership. You know, you know when, I, when I say that this is an example of, of that powerful combination of research and facts and movements, you know, I speak from personal experience because, as Jeff mentioned, I'm on the board of 350.org. And, um, you know, I, I, it, 350 is really the first um, organization that I have 
jumped into with both feet. You know, as a journalist, I've always kept my distance. You know, I report on movements and I speak, you know, at events, but, um, you know, I'm, I don't join parties. I still have this sort of like uncomfortable thing, but I joined 350 and I feel comfortable in 350. Um, you know, not to say that I, we agree on everything, but, um, you know, I. A big part of my comfort level is that this is a group founded by a fellow journalist, Bill McKibben, who, uh, as you all know, wrote the you know first book for a general audience on climate change. Just an incredible uh, journalist for the New Yorker, um, you know, just raising the alarm on this issue for so long. And as Bill tells it, you know, he used to think that books changed the world, and he discovered that he was wrong, that it isn't just enough to get the facts out, right? And so um, the, div the divestment was an issue that was, you know, was on the radar around coal. Students, particularly at Swarthmore, um, were already calling on their university to divest from their coal investments because they were involved in campaigns against mountaintop coal removal. But there wasn't a fossil fuel divestment movement at that time. And, um, where it really came from was research. It came out of this incredible research from the Carbon Tracker uh, uh, Initiative in England. And I remember um, it, it was a, a friend of mine sent me this research and said, you have to read this. And it was just one of those things, I've got so much to read, and it took me like two months like, sitting on a pile before I actually read it. And then I read it and I was like, oh my God. This is the research that says that the fossil fuel companies have five times more uh, carbon in their proven reserves than is compatible with the temperature target that our own governments have set. And, um, you know, I mean, obviously we know the fossil fuel companies have a business model that isn't particularly compatible with action on climate change, but we didn't know that they already were banking on this much carbon, that it was counted towards their stock price. And it explains so much about how hard they're fighting. And I also learned about this thing called um, the reserve replacement ratio, which is how the stock market values fossil fuel companies. Um, it means that they have to always have the same amount in their reserves as they have in production. So, uh, or, and if that drops, if they don't have 100% or more in their reserves as they have in production, then this market is going to start betting their stock price down. So they're structurally incapable of doing what we need them to do, which is leave that carbon in the ground. Now, the carbon tracker research was, um, it was specialist research. It wasn't written for a general audience. It was written um, for market analysts, and it was written as a warning, and they called it a carbon bubble. They said, look, we've just had the ha housing bubble. Now we have a carbon bubble. So, so uh, I, I was reading this, Bill was reading it at the same time, and we set up a call to talk about it. And I was like, I don't, know, I don't know about you, Bill, but when I read this, I don't think that there's a stock market bubble. I think we're the bubble, right? You know, that, that, that what is happening is that these, these fossil fuel companies have clearly decided that the two degree temperature target is meaningless. We all know it's meaningless. And when they passed it in Copenhagen, we knew it was non-binding. We knew that there's nothing to force our governments to stay to it. And these companies are just proceeding as if they can burn this carbon. They think they can do it and they're planning on doing it unless we stop them. And that's where the divestment idea comes from as a tactic to deal with this research. And um, you know, when Bill wrote the do the math piece for Rolling Stone, I mean, that piece was unbelievable, right? And it took the carbon tracker research and it popularized it. It put it in totally accessible language. It laid it out. And still, if that had just been an article in Rolling Stone, I don't think that much would have happened. It was the combination, that original research, the popularizing in a mainstream, format, and then a movement, a movement able to take it up, and people being so ready to finally be part of a movement that actually knows that it has an opponent, instead of pretending as if we're all in this together and, you know, this is just a question of getting the facts out, right? There's actually a war going on, and only one side is acting like it. So, I'm running out of time. <laughs> We're all running out of time. I'll leave you with a couple more quotes. So two weeks ago, I was in France to launch the French translation for This Changes Everything, which is called Tout Peut Changer. And I did an interview with a lovely journalist from Le Monde, who's their, one of their uh, um, climate change uh, reporters. 
And he said to me, I've been trying to figure out how to describe you. Are you a journalist without a media organization, an academic without a university, or a politician without a political party? <laughs> And I told him that the great thing about being independent is that I don't actually have to give a crap about that. <laughs> so, in that spirit, it feels fitting to celebrate the legacy of Eduardo Galliano. Um, like, like the great I.F. Stone, Galliano was a radical journalist who went on to write scholarly works of history that span centuries. He changed the world with his masterwork, The Open Veins of Latin America. <laughs> and he died too soon, just a couple of days ago. Galliano's work gleefully crossed borders of all kinds, and he made no apologies for it. He wrote, I do not believe in the frontiers that, according to literature's customs officers, separate the forms. Neither do I. Thank you so much. Thank you.